Hello, everybody. So here we are, the last chapter of Gen Chem 2. And it's about one of my favorite topics, electricity. Um, so I have the cool background. It's a plasma ball, uh, like you might have seen, that generates like static electricity. And when you touch it, it makes your hair fly everywhere. Well, inside of that plasma ball is plasma, which is a hot charged gas, essentially. It's the same thing that like um, lightning and the sun and even like neon lights are made out of it. Um, but it's charged, so it feels like it applies to chapter 20 to me. So that's why I put it here. We're going to open chapter 20 with a little bit of information about how to assign oxidation states. And so if you did okay on this in the, um, the pre chapter quiz, then you can, you can kind of skip over the next um, video or two. If, if you need a reminder on how to discover the oxidation state of different elements and compounds, then keep watching. Okay. So, um, So we again begin the chapter by looking at uh, what an oxidation reduction reaction really means. So it always involves electrons moving around. And we often shorten that up and call it just redox reactions. And we studied these in, chap in Chem 141 um, mostly as single replacement reactions. So that might be something you remember the name of. <clears throat> But in every single displacement reaction, you um, have one substance that's giving up electrons and the other one that's gaining electrons. And so that's what a redox reaction is. Redox reactions are not confined to just single replacement reactions. So like, for example, a combustion reaction is actually another redox reaction, um, even though it doesn't have a single element replacing another element in a compound. Okay, so but Single replacements are all oxidation reduction reactions, but not all oxidation reduction reactions are single replacement. So we have some vocab for this. Um, whenever something loses an electron, we say that it's being oxidized. So the way to remember it is to think about a lion. Okay, so loss of electron is oxidation. That's what LEO stands for. So oxidation is losing. And um, when something is reduced, it means it gains an electron. So loss of electron oxidation, gain of electron reduction. Now there's other ways that you might have been given um, memory prompts for this. Like I often see oil rig as another option. Oxidation is lost, reduction is gain. Um, pick one and just chant it until it sticks into your head. Because one of the primary things we have to be able to do, do is identify which thing is oxidized and which thing is reduced. Um, you can't have one without the other. They always go together. Okay. Um, so if we remember back when we were discussing why some things react with the, uh, other things and some things don't cause a reaction, it's really all about the valence electrons. And so for example, Fluorine has seven valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, which means in order to be content, it needs to only find one other electron out in the world. So anything that will give it one electron can react with fluorine, okay? So eight is the magic number. Everybody wants to have eight valence electrons except for period one, which can only handle two. All right, so eight is generally the most stable. Um, so we're gonna use that fact to help us figure out how oxidation states across all the atoms in various compounds are determined. So charge is not the same thing, I just wanna clarify. So um, on some of your periodic tables, it'll have charges in the upper right hand corner. This is the number of electrons that can be lost by that atom in the most common situations, okay? Oxidation state is not the same thing as charge. They're related, but generally speaking, the only things where oxidation state and charge are the same is for especially metals uh, in ionic bonds, okay? But in general, monatomic ions, which are mostly gonna be metals, uh, the charge equals the oxidation state. 
Otherwise, we, we tend to differentiate between oxidation state, which is kind of a, a more abstract concept that we use as a way of kind of counting electrons. Uh, whereas charge is literally, you know, like Na plus one, that's a charge because the sodium literally gives up one electron. Okay, well, oxidation states are m really more about even applicable to covalent compounds, which don't necessarily give up electrons so much as they share them in particular ways. So just remember that oxidation states are not necessarily going to be listed on the periodic table for every element that you find. Uh, instead, we have a series of rules. The first question I like to ask is, is it an element? And if the answer to that is yes, then it has no oxidation state. It has no charge. It has to be the right state of matter for that to be true. So like if it's a diatomic element like oxygen, if you just see, oh, that's not an element. But if you see O2, gas, then it is. And so it would have zero oxidation state. Um, if the answer to this first question is no, the next question is, is it ionic? Um, if so, when it, it ionizes in water, do we produce any monatomic ions? And if we do, the charge on that ion is the same thing as the oxidation state. So sodium is an example of that. Sodium plus one has an oxidation state of plus one. Then we have three elements with very specific rules that always get followed. Hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Okay. If none of the first four questions apply to whatever it is you're trying to figure out, the last rule applies to everything. Essentially, you add all the chart, all the oxidation states up, and it's going to equal the charge on the whole molecule. Okay, so here's a cheat sheet. I said all elements have an oxidation state of zero. Monatomic ions, oxidation state is equal to the charge. Hydrogen only has two choices. So these are the special rules, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Hydrogen is either plus one if it's attached to a, a non-metal or minus one if it's attached to a metal. So we may need to go back and review where are the metals and the non-metals, right? And so if this is your periodic table, that's a lovely sketch. Obviously it waves down at the bottom. <laughs> what we find is metals are everything to the left of the stair step, right? So it's that bold line on your periodic table. And the non-metals are everything above the stair step. We're gonna make them purple just for fun. Okay, so something kind of like that. Um, so you gotta remember what's what, because when hydrogen is attached to anything in the purple region, it's gonna be plus one. Acids are a classic example of that. <clears throat> or when it's bonded to any of the metals like FEH, iron hydride, that would be a minus one for the hydrogen. Okay, oxygen is um, either minus one if it's in a peroxide. The only peroxide we're going to give to you is hydrogen peroxide, so H2O2. Otherwise, by default, oxygen into, in a compound is minus two. That's not the same of, as oxygen in an element, right? O2 is the element that has zero oxidation state. We're talking specifically in number four about oxygen that is part of a compound, okay? So yeah, peroxides always minus one, anything else minus two. And that's because oxygens need two more electrons in order to get to a stable octet, eight electrons, right? Number five, fluorine is the most electronegative atom in the periodic table. So regardless of what it's connected to, it's always going to steal an electron. So that means its oxidation state is minus one. No exceptions to that. And then of course, the last rule is the same as the last slide. Everything adds up to the charge on the molecule. So for example, in sulfate, the, the oxidation state of sulfur and the four oxygens all add up to negative two because that's our charge here. I think of this as a flow chart in my head. So the first question, is it an element in the natural state? Don't forget your diatomic elements. If so, the oxidation state is zero. If it's ionic and it has monatomic ions, meaning one single atom ions and the charge is the same as the oxidation state. 
If not, and this can be partly true, right? You can have like, hmm, say this substance, which of course, if you put that in water, you get two sodium ions and a carbonate like that. So you can answer that part of the monatomic ion there. You can get the answer to that part, but still not know carbon and oxygen. So you gotta go to the next step. Okay, so it's kind of a piece by piece thing. All right, so the next is, um, do any of these special rules apply? Oxygen is always minus two, except it's if it's in a peroxide. Hydrogen is always plus one, unless it's attached to a metal, then it's minus one. And fluorine is always minus one. So we wanna look for these special rules. And once you've gotten to, the, to this point, almost all of your elements will have been identified. And all you have to do is use the last rule to solve for what remains. So let's do some problems. I am using this strategy. It might be helpful for you to have that next to the computer when you're working on this. Um, <clears throat> so sulfuric acid is our first example here. We're going to go through our list. So the first question, is it an element? Nope. There's, there's lots of things connected here, so it's definitely not an element. The next question, is there any monatomic ions when this dissociates in water? No, because it's not ionic, so no. Um, the next question, special rules. We have special rules for hydrogen and oxygen. So hydrogen is always plus one unless it's attached to a metal, and I don't see any metals. So we're going to assume each of these hydrogens is a plus one. And sulfur doesn't have special rules, but oxygen does. Oxygen, I said, the only time that you're gonna see peroxide is H2O2, and that's not this. So oxygen has to be a minus two by definition. So that's what I meant by almost everything will work out. Usually you have just one thing left at the end, and here our one thing is. So the total oxidation states on this molecule are going to add up to the total charge on the molecule. So what I mean by that is two hydrogens times plus one for each of them plus four oxygen times minus two for each of those plus whatever S is. There's only one S. If there were more, I would write like two S or three S or whatever. All of this is going to add up to the overall charge in the molecule. H2SO4 has no charge, so it'll add up to zero. All right, so we can simplify, of course. Two plus negative eight is negative six. And so we're just going to solve the algebra. So S is six. So this is how we apply the last rule. You just create your little equation to solve for the one thing you don't know, okay? All right, so I'm gonna try this again. I'm gonna erase the, the math here so we have room. We're gonna try this again. Again, as normal, the best strategy here is pause it, try it out, and then watch what I do and figure out where your strategy changed from mine, if it does. All right, so ICL4 minus one. Well, so this one's interesting. So it's not an element. It's not ionic. It is an ion, but it's not ionic because these are both nonmetals. Um, so that brings us down to the special rules, which apply to hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, none of which these are. So we don't really know anything about this compound, except that if you remember from when we did the Vesper lab and Lewis dot structures, I'm not going to draw all the electrons in, but the first thing in the list is always the center atom. So they're the ones that tend to have exceptions to the octet rule. So the things on the outside are not going to be exceptional. They're just going to have eight electrons. Well, there are normally seven valence on chlorine. So if it has eight electrons, its oxidation state is going to be one. That's true for most things in group 17, unless they're in the center atom. Okay. So then now if we know the oxidation state we believe chlorine to be, we can calculate what iodine is. So iodine will be one iodine and then four chlorine atoms. 
And it's going to add up to the total charge, which is minus 1. OK? So whatever iodine is, plus negative 4 equals negative 1. So iodine equals 3. It's not one of the ones listed on most periodic tables because it's uncommon, but you can do it. You can make this complex. It's got way more electrons on it than I drew, but you can do it. So H2 is next. Um, the first question, is it an element? Yes, it is. So the oxidation state is zero. Next question, is it an element? No, it is not. H2 is the element version of hydrogen. So this does not have a zero oxidation state. The next question is, is it ionic or does it have monatomic ions? It is a monatomic ion, so its charge is the same thing as its oxidation state. HF, all right, so first question, is it an element? No. Is it ionic? No. Do we have special rules? Of course. Fluorine is always, no exceptions, always negative one. In order for this to add up to zero, the hydrogen has to be a plus one, which is also a rule. So both rules apply here. <clears throat> and then finally, we have our friend hydrogen. So hydrogen has this, this H is attached, the hydrogen peroxide. The H is attached to the peroxide oxygens. So that's going to, I just accidentally figured out that PowerPoint can caption me while I'm talking. So I'm going to leave that on and see how that goes. <laughs> so anyway, hydrogen is attached to the oxygen. And so that means it follows the normal rules for when it's attached to anything besides a metal. So it's going to be a plus one. I had to write it on the top of my H because uh, the bottom keeps clicking on stuff. So the hydrogens are plus one. In a peroxide, oxygen always has minus one value. And you can double check your work here because two times minus one plus two times plus one has to add up to the charge, which will be zero. And it does, right? Minus two plus two equals zero. All right, so that, that's the one exception for oxygen. Otherwise, it will always be a minus two in a compound, like we saw in the beginning for sulfuric acid. <clears throat> 